I couldn't help but sit there and have flashbacks to UCLA and the Project Ones. For those of you who may not know what, uh, I guess, um, made the Project One uh, stand out, like Dr. Drake said, it was actually the first um, production that you do as a film student in UCLA, but it was actually shot on Super 8 millimeter film, and you had to build a 16 millimeter magnetic full coat soundtrack to it. So I guess that's how you said uh, Ms. Larkin, the soundtrack got corrupted or whatever, but it actually had a separate soundtrack. In fact, I was just telling someone last week uh, that uh, unfortunately film students today, I don't know if they don't have the heart or we just don't you know, twist their arms hard enough, but I actually spent 36 hours straight in what was known as the bullpen. Remember the bullpen, Makar? Known as the bullpen, that's where we used to edit the uh, project ones. It was just big room, had about 15 or 20 different little edit bays set up. I spent 36 hours straight cutting and working on my project one. It was gruesome, but I loved it. But uh, it's great to be here uh, with the uh, colloquium, and uh, I want to thank Dr. Drake for uh, inviting me. I actually um, had Dr. Drake as a student in a uh, Cine One class many years ago, and now she has a PhD. So I'm very proud of her, and uh, we definitely must have laid, <laughs> laid that groundwork very early. Um, but what I'm going to talk about is something that I decided to call Let's see, let me get out of that. I decided to call Black Power's Impact. Good. I think we got it. Yeah. I decided to call Black Power's Impact. Now this presentation is actually taken from a much longer presentation that I do called uh, Influential Impact, the Cyclization of Black Films. It actually deals with and covers the history of black films from the beginning. It's based on my co-authored book, The 50 Most Influential Black Films, that I co-authored with my sister, Dr. Venice Berry, who actually teaches at the University of Iowa. And I just pulled this segment out and kind of um, tweaked it up so that it, I think it works very, very nicely with, uh, with this situation. But throughout human history, the art of visual communications interpretation played a significant role in fostering understanding, both within and across cultures. From the earliest primitive cave drawings to today's modern computer-generated computer graphics, the old saying, a picture paints a thousand words, still rings true. But how about 10 pictures, a thousand, or several million still images moving fast and rapidly across the bright flicker of a film projector's magical lamp? This multitude of fast-flowing images will not only paint words, but they will speak volumes. In the 1960s, black films and black filmmakers were fighting against the odds to paint their words and to speak their visions onto the silver screen. And like the pioneering efforts of William Foster, Emmett Scott, Noble Johnson, and Oscar Michaud before them, these sepia storytellers forged ahead to assert control over their own filmed images. However, outside the box office, there was still an ever-growing chasm uh, growing between the races due to America's policy of bigotry and Jim Crow laws, blocking opportunities and holding blacks back. The almost insurmountable wall of prejudice and racial hatred permeated the mindset of many white Americans, and it often appeared that those in Hollywood thought no differently. Access to skilled and qualified Negro technicians was difficult since technical trade unions were closed to Negroes, and their chances of receiving bank loans to cover production costs and equipment purchases remained virtually non-existent. Then came the civil rights movement with peaceful protests and a demand to live free, prosper, and be treated like full citizens in American society. Many films echoed this effort, bringing a new sense of pride, struggle, and a fresh African-American on-screen image. In Hollywood, Woody Strode portrayed a series of unique and powerful characters, such as a falsely accused Buffalo soldier in Sergeant Rutledge, 1960, a Nubian warrior in Spartacus, 1960, and a benighted protector in The Sins of Rachel Cade, 1961. 
Strode mostly appeared only in mainstream films, however, and he was often the only dark face on the screen. Sidney Poitier stood tall and strong in on-screen performances throughout the 1960s by starring in socially conscious films such as A Raisin in the Sun, 1961, In the Heat of the Night, 1967, and Guess Who's Coming to Dinner, 1967. Ivan Dixon made his mark in the powerful social drama Nothing But a Man, 1964. And he could also be seen on television in the popular television series The Fugitive in 1967 with Diane Sands and as Sergeant Kinchlow in Hogan's Heroes. Despite the examples of Strode, Portier, and Dixon, however, such strong and dignified roles for black actors were in short supply. And what would these bold black male characters and roles be without their strong and beautiful on-screen leading ladies such as Diane Carroll, Ruby Dee, Claudia McNeil, Cicely Tyson, Dorothy Dandridge, and Abby Lincoln. Meanwhile, the independent filmmakers operating outside of Hollywood were working hard to help fill the black image void. Several art house films made it to the big screen that attempted to comment on the mental anguish that just being black in America often brought to bear with its strict codes of separation and racial inequities. These included Carl Lerner's Black Like Me, 1964, Leo Penn's A Man Called Adam, 1966, with Sammy Davis Jr. and Cicely Tyson, and Anthony Harvey's Dutchman in 1967, starring Al Freeman Jr. In 1969, The Learning Tree, a film based on still photographer Gordon Parks' autobiography was released. It is a powerful portrait of a young black kid coming of age in a racist Midwestern town that brought a quiet and dignified humanity to the screen. Parks actually made history by becoming the first African American to direct a major motion picture for a Hollywood studio. He also wrote the script, produced the film, and composed the original music score. Ground had been broken, progress had been made, and there was a strong wind blowing through the inner cities that would soon hit Hollywood with hurricane force. We all know what that was, right? I thought so. The tide was turning as African-American communities refused to accept lower class treatment and widespread racial discrimination any longer. The emphasis was shifting from that of nonviolent resistance to the bold and assertive tactics being stressed by the ongoing black power movement. Melvin Van Peebles, independent film Sweet Sweetback's Badass Song in 1971, with its rebellious anti-hero lead, literally kicked what became known as the black exploitation era into high gear. It lasted from 1971 to 1976, consisting of five years of angry soul brothers and soul sisters kicking the man's butt all over the big screen. These films included strong, hard-hitting titles like Shaft, Superfly, The Mac, Trouble Man, Cleopatra Jones, Coffee, Foxy Brown, and Blackula, just to name a few. Now, these movies made instant stars out of these people. Now, this is where audience participation comes in, all right? So let's see who knows what. Who was this guy? Richard Roundtree and Shaft. All right, here comes the next one. What you got? Ron O'Neill. What film? Superfly. All right, all right. Somebody's been studying. All right, how about this beautiful woman? Pam Greer. That's right. Well, she's got several, but I think this was from Coffee. And how about this one? Anybody remember her? Uh, what? Tamara Dobson. And she was Cleopatra Jones. Then we have Blackula, William Marshall. We all know about him. This guy, everybody knows him. Who's he? Jim Brown. And he was a slaughter. Of course, he actually played in quite a few um, black exploitation films. Now, this is one of my favorites. This was actually one of my favorite pictures ever. Who's this? And, 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 all right, Gloria Hendry, Black Bell Jones. This was a very refined actor, Raymond St. Jacques. And of course, we get back to Melvin Van Peebles and this guy coming up. 
Robert Hooks. In fact, I was just in uh, L.A. back in uh, November, and Robert Hooks gave a speech. He had, now has a book out that chronicles his life, and I went to a, a presentation that he did um, at, at the, the Hollywood Library. It was very interesting, so he's doing very well. And this was another nice movie. Anybody see this movie? It was a cowboy, uh, Bonnie and Clyde, known as Bushrod and Thomasine, Vanetta McGee and Max Julian. Now, who can tell me for extra, for extra credit on this little pop quiz? Who can tell me what um, film or what role Max Julian is really well known for? The Mac, that's right, the Mac. And then we got this guy here, Fred Williamson, the hammer. And this guy here, Yafit Koto. I remember seeing him as the, the, the bad guy in a, in a James Bond flick, and that was one of the most powerful roles. I, ooh, he's a black man in James Bond. It was, it was phenomenal. I loved it. And moving on. <laughs> Controversy soon erupted over how negative many of these images actually were. Now, Rudy Ray Moore's now classic uh, ghetto film, Dolomite, 1975, was produced independently and outside of Hollywood, but it did nothing to improve the black image on film. Now, to some, the glorification of pimps, hookers, and drug dealers was no better than the olden day stereotypes of mammies, coons, bucks, brutes, and Uncle Toms. However, during the black exploitation era, Hollywood served us up some rock'em sock'em Negroes and they made lots of money. However, by 1976, black films were on their way out. Just as it seemed they were gaining a foothold, getting some clout, and possibly building a little power, it was all gone. Although these films may have saved some Hollywood studios for, from filing bankruptcy, because I'm sure you all know that uh, around this time, uh, um, television had just come in and a lot of people were staying home watching TV, Hollywood was in trouble. Black exploitation films saved a lot of them from going under. But despite this fact, they refused to change the themes and the images to appease the target audience and simply concluded that black films were no longer profitable. Today, as black films adapt and conform to the changing times, these salacious tales and soulful images will continue to entertain, enlighten, and impact our society for many years to come. And finally, in a bit of shameless self-promotion, in addition to being a professor filmmaker and a published author of two film resource books, The 50 Most Influential Black Films and History Dictionary, Historical Dictionary of African American Cinema, I also have a few copies of my self-published novel with me, or novels, Cry Tough and Honey Man's Son. I'd rather not have to take them back home. So anyone interested in obtaining a copy to share my words as well as my images, please see me at the end of this event. I'd appreciate it. And I will uh, end my part of uh, this panel with a uh, short segment from my latest um, documentary film. I don't know, uh, how many of you are familiar with uh, Dunbar High School? How many of you, uh, last, just last, what was it, last Thursday, um, I was actually involved in a uh, documentary on Dunbar High School called uh, Dun Dunbar, the uh, Alchemy of uh, Achievement. Yeah, okay, you can go ahead. Dunbar, the Alchemy of Achievement, and it was very, very well received. Uh, so this is just a short part. The uh, actual documentary is an hour long. This is just a short segment, and uh, I think it also fits quite nicely into this program. I won't say a lot about it. I'll just let my work speak for itself. Here we go. Founded in January 1913 at Howard University, Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated is an organization of college-educated women committed to the constructive development of its members and to public service with a primary focus on the black community. The organization is a sisterhood of predominantly black women with 1,000 collegiate and alumni chapters located in the United States and England, Japan, Germany, 
Virgin Islands, Bermuda, the Bahamas, Jamaica, and the Republic of Korea. Today, Delta has approximately 200,000 members, making it the largest black sorority in the world. In the 1960s, Say It Loud, I'm Black and I'm Proud, became the battle cry for African Americans to accept our dark skin and turn a perceived negative aspect of our very being into a positive. A new race pride had been awakened, a social awareness had been raised, and a multitude of filmed images was about to hit the silver screens to help solidify our fresh new black consciousness. Salted by former NFL star Jim Brown's role as a tough Southern Sheriff in Tick, 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 and peppered by the hip-talking cop duel of Raymond St. Jocks and Godfrey Cambridge in Cotton Comes to Harlem, the scene was being set for something exciting and new, something that would give birth to a whole new film genre that would light up darkened movie houses like never before. Melvin Van Peebles' independent film, Sweet Sweet Back's Badass Song, with this rebellious anti-hero lead, kicked what became known as the black exploitation era into high gear. Lasting from 1971 to 1976, it was five years of angry soul brothers and soul sisters kicking the man's butt all over the big screen. These films had hard-hitting titles like Shaft, Superfly, Slaughter, Sheba Baby, Trouble Man, Hit Man, Coffee, Cleopatra Jones, Hell Up in Harlem, Black Belt Jones, and Blackula, giving black actors on the screen a power and identity like never before. The black exploitation movies did give, uh, in a very superficial way, the image on screen, which, you know, which often was white occupied territory. Uh, in some cases where African-American actors uh, were uh, beating the hell out of white actors, it, it, did, it did provide, in a very superficial way, uh, a, a sense of empowerment. Controversy soon erupted over how negative many of these images actually were. To some, the glorification of pimps, hookers, and drug dealers was no better than the olden day stereotypes of mammies, coons, and Uncle Toms. Regardless, these films were making a lot of money, and due to the tremendous rise in television viewership, they saved many Hollywood studios from filing bankruptcy. Black exploitation, uh, especially at the time it appeared, did uh, bring a great deal of the African American population including the African population in, in, in Latin America, especially Brazil and Africa, into the theaters. And so I would say it was a major economic uh, blood transfusion for Hollywood. At the Delta Sigma Theta Sororities National Convention in 1973, President Lillian P. Benbow announced that through the organization's Commission on Arts and Letters, a full-length, Hollywood-style motion picture was to be made. Members were troubled by the way women were being portrayed in many of these black exploitation films. Black exploitation films were typically low budget, had uh, extraordinary representations of violence, often didn't present the black community well, and specifically, the image of women was really troubling, of black women. They were often the victims of sexual violence. Misogyny, uh, torture and rape was a popular theme in some of these films. And so Delta is seeking to, again, intervene on these troublesome narratives that cast the black community generally as deficient and deviant and said, we're about doing something different. We can do something better. We can make a compelling story about blackness that is black life and history and culture without reducing it to these really base stereotypes of blackness. It was time to take control of their on-screen image, enter into the realm of media activism, and become the first black women's organization to produce a feature-length film. 
Thus, the Cassini concept was born. This was a bold move as a sorority, African American at that, deciding to be the executive, an executive producer or producer of a film. It had just never been done before. There were a lot of reasons why the film tanked in terms of the distribution and uh, in terms of the legacy of remembrance of Countdown at Cusini. <laughs> Shot in and around Lagos, Nigeria, Countdown at Kusini is a pan-African melodrama, a tale of political intrigue centered on an African-American jazz musician who falls for a beautiful rebel freedom fighter. When a mercenary assassin is hired to kill the popular rebel leader, he becomes entangled in the struggle for the independence of the fictional African nation of Fahari. But its struggle continues. To kill the snake when first cuts off the head. I have said it over and over and over. Get Matapu into the open and kill him. Freeze! Mr. Salter. You are an American. <laughs> an Afro-American, yeah. It is very important, it, Mr. Salter, it is absolutely essential that you in America get to know us in Africa and that we in Africa get to know you in America. I dig you and what you stand for. I'll be around. Again, I, I'm still today uh, inspired by the effort, the courage, and the ambition of, of Delta Sigma Theta marshalling all their resources together to put this film out, whether it was ex as successful as they had hoped it would be or not. It still was a very important historical moment that has some resonance even to today, even if some people don't necessarily remember the film. It's still in the DNA of Delta, Sigma Theta. Sorority Incorporated. <laughs> All right, sorry we had to stop it. But uh, just to go on, the, the documentary is actually about a film called um, Countdown at Cusini. Anyone familiar with Countdown at Cusini? Delta Sigma Theta Sorority Incorporated actually financed a motion picture back in 1976. Uh, the contention of my documentary is that if they did not fail, they were actually sabotaged by the distributor. Those ladies could have made a lot of money, and I still believe that they uh, could still make money today. I'm actually having a premiere of the 40th anniversary of the release of uh, Countdown to Cusini, my documentary, and a cut down version of the film in Detroit with the Detroit uh, alumni chapter uh, next Saturday. So it should be rather exciting. So thank you so much. I appreciate it.